Good morning, Space Monkeys. Welcome to Political Fight Club. I'm Robert Durden, and in this episode, we're going to be doing the first half of the first chapter of Black Shirts and Reds by Michael Parenti. I'm going to be busy the next couple of days, so I won't get an episode to you until Friday, but I have two or three more, including a roast, coming out on Friday, so I'll get those to you as soon as I can. And uh, this is going to be the first half of the first chapter of this book, and I want to thank the people that have recommended this book to me. Parenti's writing is very accessible. Um, it's going to be a really fun read, I think, a really easy read for us, and uh, I had not read him before, so thank you to you guys. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. The first half of this chapter, the chapter is called Rational Fascism, is about Mussolini and Hitler and how they came to power and what propelled them to power, what groups they were a part of, and what their ideologies were, and it's also going to talk a lot about something that I've talked about on the show, which is how corporate interests and corporatism and fascism go hand in hand. Capitalism, in fact, like big business, has always been a propeller of fascism. So that's interesting, and that's also why I've always said on my show that it doesn't really matter what party, Democrat or Republican, you put in office. Fascism is coming because they're both capitalist parties and they're authoritarian parties, and they have the same donors. So it doesn't matter what color tie they wear to work, you're ushering in fascism. The only difference really, really, between the Republicans and the Democrats is like their PR team. So let's start here. Page one, chapter one. While walking through New York's Little Italy, I passed a novelty shop that displayed posters and t-shirts of Benito Mussolini giving the fascist salute. When I entered the shop and asked the clerk why such items were being offered, he replied, well, some people like them, and you know, maybe we need someone like Mussolini in this country. His comment was a reminder that fascism survives as something more than a historical curiosity. Worse than posters or t-shirts are the works by various writers bent on explaining Hitler or reevaluating Franco, or in other ways sanitizing fascist history. In Italy during the 1970s, there emerged a veritable cottage industry of books and articles claiming that Mussolini not only made the trains run on time, but also made Italy work well. All these publications, along with many conventional academic studies, have one thing in common. They say little, if anything, about the class politics policies of fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. How did these regimes deal with social services, taxes, business, and the conditions of labor? For whose benefit? and at whose expense. Most of the literature on fascism and Nazism does not tell us. Plutocrats choose autocrats. Let us begin with a look at fascism's founder. Born in 1883, the son of a blacksmith, Benito Mussolini's early manhood was marked by street brawls, arrests, jailings, and violent radical political activities. Before World War I, Mussolini was a socialist. A brilliant organizer, agitator, and gifted journalist, he became editor of the Socialist Party's official newspaper. Yet many of his comrades suspected him of being less interested in advancing socialism than in advancing himself. That's why one of the rules of Fight Club is don't sell out, because there will be people that will pretend like they're socialists, and then it turns out they're actually not. They're just pretending to be a socialist to make money. Kind of like Mussolini. You know who I'm talking about. But I digress. <clears throat> Indeed, when the Italian upper class tempted him with recognition, financial support, and the promise of power, he did not hesitate to switch sides. By the end of World War I, Mussolini, the socialist, who had organized strikes for workers and peasants, had become Mussolini, the fascist, who broke strikes on behalf of financiers and landowners. Using the huge sums he received from wealthy interests, he projected himself onto the national scene as the acknowledged leader of the I Fasci di Combattimento, a movement composed of black-shirted ex-army officers and sundry toasts who were guided by no clear political doctrine other than a militaristic patriotism and conservative dislike for anything associated with socialism and organized labor. The fascist black shirts spent their time attacking trade unionists, socialists, communists, and farm cooperatives. After World War I, Italy had settled into a pattern of parliamentary de democracy. The low pay scales were improving, and the trains were already running on time, but the capitalist economy was in a post-war recession. Investments stagnated, heavy industry operated far below capacity, and corporate profits and agribusiness exports were declining. Sound a little bit familiar? Anyway, 
<clears throat> to maintain profit levels, the large landowners and industrialists would have to slash wages and raise prices. The state, in turn, would have to provide them with massive subsidies and tax exemptions. To finance this corporate welfareism, the populace would have to be taxed more heavily, and the social services and welfare expenditures would have to be drastically cut, measures that might sound familiar to us today. Indeed, Mr. Prende, indeed. But the government was not completely free to pursue this course. By 1921, many Italian workers and peasants were unionized and had their own political organizations. With demonstrations, strikes, boycotts, factory takeovers, and the forcible occupation of farmlands, they had won the right to organize, along with the concessions in wages and work conditions. Let me reread that sentence. Just make a mental note. With demonstrations, strikes, boycotts, factory takeovers, and the forcible occupation of farmlands, they had won the right to organize, along with concessions in wages and work conditions. Sounds important. To impose a full measure of austerity upon workers and peasants, the ruling economic interests would have to abolish the democratic rights that helped the masses defend their modest living standards. The solution was to smash their unions, political organizations, and civil liberties. Industrialists and big landowners wanted someone at the helm who could break the power of organized workers and farm laborers and impose a stern order on the masses. For this task, Benito Mussolini, armed with his gangs of black shirts, seemed the likely candidate. So this is, you see why I'm a little bit weary of fake socialists who are really just capitalists doing this for money on our side? In history, traditionally those people, if you throw money at them, they'll flip and become our worst enemy and be the ones that actually destroy our momentum on the left, which is exactly what they're doing now, which is something people don't understand why I go after the boutique left. It's because they're not real leftists. They're hiding amongst us and nerfing our momentum and it actively stifling the left movement. So it's not like, oh, this is just a difference of opinion. No, this is a difference in strategy, and your strategy doesn't get us anything done. Our strategy will, but they go out there, and, and this is also why I don't mind, like, you know, we can put our partisan differences aside, our political groups aside, and unite with people of the opposite party to get things done as the proletariat, as poor people. I know that most farmers in my area, almost all of them, they're going to be Republican, but I'm going to work with them because it's important that they have good wages and they will agree with me on a lot of things that poor people agree with you on, regardless of what party you're part of, what team you're playing for. And it's only through those organizations, those human connections that we're actually going to get something done. And that's why the boutique left tries to demonize farmers, well, not just farmers, but just Republicans, which are almost all the farmers, and make you hate them, make us divided because they know that's the solution to the capitalist problem. Anyway, I digress. <clears throat> in 1922, the Federazione Industriale, composed of the leaders of industry, along with representatives from the banking and agribusiness associations, met with Mussolini to plan the March on Rome, contributing 20 million lire in the undertaking. With the additional backing of Italy's top military officers and police chiefs, the fascist revolution, a really a coup, took place. Within two years after seizing state power, Mussolini had shut down all opposition newspapers and crushed the socialist, liberal, Catholic, Democratic, and Republican parties, which together had commanded some 80% of the vote. So does that sound like anyone now? Sounds a lot like Zelensky. Didn't he just do exactly this same thing? I'm just saying. Labor leaders, peasant leaders, parliamentary delegates, and others critical of the new regime were beaten, exiled, or murdered by fascist terror squadri squadristi. The Italian Communist Party endured the severest repression of all, yet managed to maintain a courageous underground resistance that eventually evolved into armed struggle against the black shirts and the German occupying force. In Germany, a similar pattern of complicity between fascist and capitalist emerged. German workers and farm laborers had won the right to unionize, the eight-hour eight day, the unemployment insurance, but to revive profit levels, heavy industry and big finance wanted to wage cut for their workers and massive state subsidies and tax cuts for themselves. During the 1920s, the Nazi Sturmabeitung, uh, Sturmabeitung I don't, sorry, I don't speak very good German, or SA, 
We're just going to call it SA from now on. The brown-shirted stormtroopers subsidized by business were used mostly as anti-labor paramilitary force whose function was to terrorize workers and farm laborers. By 1930, most of the tycoons had concluded that the Weimar Republic no longer served their needs and was too accommodating to the working class. They greatly increased their subsidies to Hitler, propelling the Nazi party onto the national stage. Business tycoons supplied the Nazis with generous funds for fleets of motor cars and loudspeakers to saturate the cities and villages of Germany, along with funds for Nazi party organizations, youth groups, and paramilitary forces. In the July 1932 campaign, Hitler had sufficient funds to fly to 50 cities in the last two weeks alone. In that same campaign, the Nazis received 37.3% of the vote, the highest they had ever won in a democratic national election. They never had a majority of the people on their side. To the extent that they had any kind of reliable base, it generally was among the more affluent members of society. In addition, elements of the petty bourgeoisie and many lumpen proletariats served as strong arm party thugs organized to the SA stormtroopers. But the great majority of the organized working class supported the communist or social democrats to the very end. Interesting. In December 1932 election, three candidates ran for president, the conservative incumbent Field Marshal von Hindenburg, the Nazi candidate Adolf Hitler, and the Communist Party candidate Ernst Thälmann. In his campaign, Thälmann argued that a vote for Hindenburg amounted to a vote for Hitler and that Hitler would lead the Germans into war. The bourgeois press, including the Social Democrats, denounced this view as Moscow-inspired. Hindenburg was re-elected while the Nazis dropped approximately 2 million votes in the Reichstag election as compared to their peak for over, of over 13.7 million. True to form, the Social Democrat leaders refused the Communist Party's proposal to form an 11th hour coalition against Nazism. You don't say! As in many other countries past and present, so in Germany, the Social Democrats would sooner ally themselves with the reactionary right than make common cause with the Reds. Meanwhile, a number of right-wing parties coalesced behind the Nazis, and in January 1933, just weeks after the election, Hindenburg invited Hitler to become Chancellor. You see why I'm so skeptical and why I go after Social Democrats so much? They say that we're the right-wingers. They say we're doing a Red-Brown alliance. No, you guys are acting more fascist than we are. So, I digress. Upon assuming state power, Hitler and his Nazis pursued a political economic agenda not unlike Mussolini's. They crushed organized labor and eradicated all elections, op opposition parties, and independent publications. Hundreds of thousands of opponents were imprisoned, tortured, and murdered. In Germany, as in Italy, the communists endured the severest political repression of all groups. Here were two peoples, the Italians and the Germans, with different histories, cultures, and languages, and supposedly different temperaments, who ended up with the same repressive solutions because of the compelling similarities of economic power and class conflict that prevailed in the respective countries. In such diverse countries as Lithuania, Croatia, Romania, Hungary, and Spain, a similar fascist pattern emerged to do its utmost to save big capital from the impositions of democracy. Whom did the fascists support? There's a vast literature on who supported the Nazis, but relatively little on whom the Nazis supported after they came to power. This is in keeping with the tendency of conventional scholarship to avoid the entire subject of capitalism whenever something unfavorable might be said about it. Whose interests did Mussolini and Hitler support? In both Italy in the 1920s and Germany in the 30s, old industri industrial evils thought to have passed permanently into history reemerged as the conditions of labor deteriorated precipitously. In the name of saving society from the Red Menace, unions and strikes were outlawed. Union property and farm cooperatives were confiscated and handed over to the rich private owners. Minimum wage laws, overtime pay, and factory safety regulations were abolished. Speed-ups became commonplace. Dismissals or imprisonment awaited those workers who complained about unsafe or inhumane working conditions. Workers toiled longer hours for less pay. The already modest wages were severely cut, in Germany by 25 to 40 percent, in Italy by 50 percent. In Italy, child labor was reintroduced. Again, sound vaguely familiar to what's going on in this country? 
We're right on the cusp of this. To be sure, a few crumbs were thrown to the populace. There were free concerts and sporting events, some meager social programs, a dole for the unemployed financed mostly by contributions from the working people, and showy public work projects designed to evoke civic pride. Both Mussolini and Hitler showed their gratitude to their big business patrons by privatizing many perfectly solvent, state-owned steel mills, power plants, banks, and steamship companies. Both regimes dipped heavily into the public treasury to refloat or subsidize heavy industry. Agribusiness farming was expanded and heavily subsidized. Both states guaranteed a return on the capital invested by giant corporations while assuming most of the risks and losses in, uh, on investments. As is often the case with reactionary regimes, public capital was raided by private capital. At the same time, taxes were increased for the general populace but lowered or eliminated for the rich and big business. Inheritance taxes on the wealthy were greatly reduced or abolished altogether, which, again, sound like we've been talking about that for years. The rich want to get rid of um, taxes on their inheritance money. As a result of all this, in Italy during the 1930s, the economy was gripped by a recession, a staggering public debt, and widespread corruption. But industrial profits rose and the armaments factories busily rolled out weapons in preparation for the war to come. In Germany, unemployment was cut in half with the considerable expansion of armament jobs. But overall poverty increased because of the drastic wage cuts. And that's kind of what's going on right now. You see all of the Bidenites going out there and talking about how unemployment is low. Yeah, because you kicked everybody off of unemployment insurance, but you didn't raise wages. You forced everyone back to work. So unemployment is low, but poverty is through the roof. So, and that's the important thing is like, unemployment doesn't mean a goddamn thing. You know, unemployment's low during feudalism and slavery as well. Doesn't mean people are doing well, you know? During the radical 1930s, in the U.S., Great Britain, and Scandinavia, upper-income groups experienced a modest decline in their share of the national income, but in Germany, the top 5% enjoyed a 15% gain. Despite this record, most writers have ignored fascism's close collaboration with big business. Some even argue that business was not a beneficiary but a victim of fascism. Angelo Colavia, a Hoover Institute conservative scribe blithely announced, quote, if fascism means anything, it means government ownership and control of business. Thus, fascism is misrepresented as a mutant form of socialism. In fact, if fascism means anything, it means all-out government support for business and severe repression of anti-business pro-labor forces. If fascism merely is a dictatorial force, dictatorial force in the surface of capitalism, that may not be all it is. But that certainly is an important part of fascism's raison d'etre, the function Hitler himself kept referring to when he talked about saving the industri industrialists and bankers from Bolshevism. It is a subject that deserves far more attention than it has received. While the fascists might have believed they were saving the plutocrats from the Reds, in fact, the revolutionary left was never strong enough to take state power in either Italy or Germany. Popular forces, however, were strong enough to cut into profit rates and interfere with the capital accumulation process. This frustrated capitalism's attempts to resolve its internal contradictions by shifting more and more of its costs onto the backs of the working populace. Revolution or no revolution, this democratic working class resistance was troublesome for the moneyed interests. You don't say. We can do that here. I think we should. Along with serving the capitalists, Fascist leaders served themselves, getting in on the money at every opportunity. Their personal greed and their class loyalties were two sides of the same coin. Mussolini and his cohorts lived lavishly, cavorting with the higher circles of wealth and aristocracy. Nazi officials and SS commanders amassed personal fortunes by plundering conquered territories and stealing from concentration camp inmates and other political vi victims. Huge amounts were made from the secretly owned, well-connected businesses and from contracting out camp slave labor to industrial firms like IG Farben and Krupp. Hitler is usually portrayed as an ideological fanatic, uninterested in crass material things. In fact, he accumulated an immense fortune, much of it in questionable ways. He expropriated artworks from the public domain, he stole enormous sums from the Nazi party coffers, he invented a new concept, the personality right, that enabled him to charge a small fee for every postage stamp 
with his picture on it, a venture that made him hundreds of millions of marks. The greatest source of Hitler's wealth was a secret slush, slush fund to which German leading industrialists regularly donated. Hitler, quote, knew that as long as German industry was making money, his private money sources would be inexhaustible. Thus, thus he'd see to it that the German is industry was never better off than under his rule by launching, for one thing, gigantic armament projects, or what we would today call fat defense contracts. From being, far from being ascetic, Hitler lived self-indulgently. During his entire tenure in office, he got special rulings from the German tax office that allowed him to avoid paying income or property taxes. He had a motor pool of limousines, private apartments, country homes, a vast staff of servants, and a majestic state in the Alps. His happiest times were spent entertaining European royalty, including the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, who numbered among his enthusiastic admirers. Kudos for Adolf and Benito. Italian fascism and German Nazism had their admirers within the U.S. business community and the corporate-owned press. Bankers, publishers, and industrialists, including the likes of Henry Ford, traveled to Rome and Berlin to pay homage, receive medals, and strike profitable deals. Many did their utmost, utmost to advance the Nazi war effort, sharing military-industrial secrets and engaging in secret transactions with the Nazi government even after the United States entered the war. During the 1920s and early 30s, major publications like Fortune, The Wall Street Journal, Saturday Evening Post, New York Times, The Chicago Tribune, and The Christian Science Monitor hailed Mussolini as the man who rescued Italy from anarchy and radicalism. They spun rhapsodic fantasies of a resurrected Italy where poverty and exploitation had suddenly disappeared, where reds had been vanquished, harmony reigned, and black shirts protected a quote-unquote new democracy. The Italian language press in the United States eagerly joined the chorus. The two most influential newspapers, La Italia of San Francisco, financed largely by A.P. Giannini's Bank of America, and Il Progresso of New York, owned by multimillionaire Generoso Pope, looked favorably on the fascist regime and suggested that the United States could benefit from a similar social order. Some dissenters refused to join the We Adore Benito chorus. The nation reminded its readers that Mussolini was not saving democracy but destroying it. Progressives of all stripes and various labor leaders denounced fascism, but their critical sentiments received little exposure in the U.S. corporate media. As with Mussolini, so, so with Hitler, the press did not look too unkindly upon Der Fuhrer's Nazi dictatorship. There was a strong give Adolf a chance contingent, some of it greased by Nazi money, in exchange for more positive coverage in the Hearst newspapers, for instance, the Nazis paid almost 10 times the standard subscription rate for, rate for Hearst's INS wire service. In return, William Randolph Hearst instructed his correspondents in Germany to file friendly reports about Hitler's regime. Those who refused were transferred or fired. Hearst newspapers even opened their pages to occasional guest columns by prominent Nazi leaders like Alfred Rosenberg or Ermann Goering. By the mid, -late mid to late 1930s, Italy and Germany allied with Japan, another industrial latecomer, were aggressively seeking a share of the world's markets and colonial booty, an expansionism that brought the, them increasingly into conflict with more established Western capitalist nations like Great Britain, France, and the U.S. As the clouds of war gathered, U.S. press opinion about the Axis powers took on a decisively critical tone. And we're going to stop there. I'll read to you the second half either late tonight or on Friday. And uh, as you can tell, it's a wonderful book. It's very well written, very accessible. And I didn't know most of this stuff. So I want to thank you guys for recommending the book to me. I have read the whole first chapter. I'll finish it up to in the next two or three days. Keep fighting that good fight out there.